Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Vadim Koziulin from Pearson for Policy Studies in Moscow, uh, independent think tank based in 1994, which means that we are almost the oldest NGO independent think tank in Russia. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to this knowledgeable and respected audience, and I would like to thank hosts and organizers of the conference for that. Being the first speaker at the first panel, I feel certain responsibility for the atmosphere in the room. So I probably uh, try to tune it to a constructive, friendly mode, and that's why I'll, uh, I'll begin with uh, globalization. When I say globalization, I mean that countries voluntarily transfer some of their powers to supranational regional institution. And first of all, I'd like to mention some recent positive examples of globalization where Russia is a part of. Shanghai Cooperation Organization. India and Pakistan are in the process of joining SEO. Afghanistan is expected to join it in the near future. Looking at the map, it becomes clear that the all nearest neighbors of Afghanistan are members of the SCO, and it will be natural if this organization plays a bigger role in promoting and develop, uh, uh, promoting development of this country in future. I guess that global security will depend a lot on the situation in Afghanistan. The ongoing multilateral negotiation in Afghanistan with participation of governments of Afghanistan, Pakistan, United States and uh, China as well as representatives of Taliban give a hope for peaceful solution to the contradictions and the formation of a government of consent. Economic pro uh, projects developed by China and India, as well as multilateral projects with neighboring countries in Afghanistan, show that constructive dialogue is possible even under conflict conditions. And there is a hope that this dialogue may become a key to resolving this conflict. Next, creation of multilateral economic unions and infrastructure projects. The Eurasian Economic Union, the China Silk Road Economic Belt, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, and the Trans-Pacific Partnership. There is a space for collaborative engagement of these and other regional projects that may harmonize economic relations and make different regions closer to each other. The agreement on Iran, Iran's nuclear program, gives us a good example of very sincere and multilaterally beneficial negotiations and agreement which finally help to avoid quite dangerous and possibly destructive crisis. Uh, the US-Russian deal on tools in Syria engaged various groups in negotiations and allowed to begin inter-Syrian dialogue on the formation of coalition government. And I believe that there, is, uh, that there comes transition from the coalition of truth to the coalition of restoration in Syria. We all regret about Libya and Yemen, which are torn by wars. Still, examples of settlement in Iran, Syria and Afghanistan give us modest hope that international wisdom and cooperation could open the door to fundamental positive changes in these countries too. Having said that, I cannot avoid considerable negative potential that has accumulated in international relations and has already caused many sacrifices. Serious challenges in the global security system originate from uncontrolled areas which have become tools in the hands of illegitimate leaders, warlords, criminal syndicates, separatists and religion fanatics. Regretfully, regional and global players also occasionally use those uncontrolled areas in their interests. Terrorism, increase of threat from northern Afghanistan is expected this summer. These can also be a higher, there also can be a higher number of border incidents. 
The ISIL militants may change their location and try to explore new areas in Afghanistan, Tajikistan, as well as Kyrgyzstan. This may cause a new wave of refugees from countries that are considered stable today. The threat of use of weapons of mass destruction, including nuclear, chemical, and biological weapons, as well as advanced technologies like drones or like cyber attacks by terrorists, this threat is much higher today. We know that terrorists make efforts to gain those means. Although threat, uh, another threat is the conflict between major powers, which can lead to rivalry between the global economic projects. New global economic unions that I mentioned, uh, mentioned at the beginning have a potential to become tools against competitors and their economic unions, which wouldn't make the world safer. Frictions and contradictions of relations between the United States and Russia and China are building up. It happens at a time when joint efforts and actions are obviously required and badly needed. Deployment of missile defense system in Europe and the Asia-Pacific region designed to provide security to one part of the world for the sake of another should undoubtedly provoke reaction which might be and probably will be military build-up. Statistics show that number of victims of international conflicts gradually reduces, reduces since the World War II. Still, the number of conflicts is higher today than ever before. Some phenomena occurring in the world also add instability and cause insecurity, which are world economic crisis, low oil prices and changes in energy policies, uh, changing uh, energy policies in some developed countries, unsettled water and energy conflicts in many regions, expected replacement of aged leaders in some countries, also lowering living standards in developing countries as well as in developed countries, radicalization of inter-religion uh, relations. We feel a deficit of religious tolerance in the world and sometimes at quite high political level. The world enjoys new stage of development in modern technologies. Still, we should expect emergence of lethal autonomous weapon system, systems, new types of weapons operating underwater, in the sea, and even in the space, weapons based on new principles, hypersonic and high precision munitions. If this process goes without control, we might face a new arms race. All these pro uh, problems increase the global climate uh, increased by the uh, global climate changes and environmental concerns. Still, we have many opportunities for problem solving, forming regional security systems on the common principles of equality, mutual consideration of interests, refraining from strengthening security at the expense of another, uh, other players, interaction of regional economic and political organizations would contribute to a global stability architecture by relying on the UN Charter and collective action. How Russia could contribute to solution of the world's problems? Russia would obviously try to strengthen and spread the Eurasian Economic Union. There is a possibility of Tajikistan joining the Union as well as signing free uh, trade agreement with Uzbekistan. The framework agreement have already been signed with Vietnam. Similar agreements could be expected with India, Israel, Iran and other countries. The Russian leadership values the truth in Syria as its important achievement. So uh, the outcomes of this experience can be that military technical and military assistance to allied states might be adopted as an effective tool of the modern Russian policy. There are some indications that Russian leadership defines its respective policy towards Afghanistan. We might expect that Russia, together with CSTO, Ellis, and SCO organization, and maybe even BRICS, could play a bigger role 
in reconciliation in Afghanistan and in regional and global security. The fact that India and Pakistan joined the Shanghai Cooperation Organization enables the SCO to become a venue for multilateral negotiation of issues between those two countries, including the issue of Afghanistan neutrality. Also, I think that Conference on Interaction and Cooperation in Central Asia, uh, based on the initiative of President of Kazakhstan, Nur Sultan Nazarbayev, will also gain great potential for resolving regional problems. The national security of every nation requires global and regional cooperation to maintain peace and ensure universal access to so-called common goods. Thank you. event for, uh, for inviting me to this, uh, to this conference and to this panel, and especially to Fahad for getting me here from Brussels, where the airport is, uh, is still closed. Um, now our job on this, uh, on this plenary panel is, is to give you our two cents of, uh, of global powers, perceptions and actions vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the Near East and South Asia region in the next four or five years. Um, and you'll ask yourself, a guy from Belgium? Um, what? Is that a global power? When did Belgium become a global power? Is that when it started exporting foreign fighters to France? Um, probably not. Um, it's not an, an April Fool's joke, I think, um, of the organizers to have me on this panel. They've asked me to present an EU perspective, which may be problematic from two other perspectives, uh, perhaps. Uh, I'll grant you that. Uh, first, one could question whether the European Union is truly a global power. After all, its, its foreign uh, security policy uh, exists by the grace of consensus between all of its 28 member states. It does not have uh, its own uh, force projection akin to that of the US or China or, or indeed Russia. And its biggest EU member states, the UK, France and Germany, are at best middle powers, not global powers. Still, my answer to the question would be, uh, would be affirmative in view of the EU's uh, economic might. As the world's biggest uh, single market um, operated by way of supranational governance, the EU is uh, a global power in those terms, whose soft but also coercive power uh, present a force to be reckoned with. See the pull factor of the migrants that come to Europe, and also the, uh, the, the effective enforcement of targeted sanctions by the European Union. But then the critics would say, okay, um, but do we really know whether the European Union will sp still be around in 2020? Um, and here my uh, well, uh, answer would still be yes. Uh, it is true that, uh, that the European Union is, is yet at another uh, defining moment in its, uh, in its uh, integration history. It is facing big uh, challenges, uh, political, socio-economic, both from within as well as uh, outside. And Brexit and Brexit have become bywords uh, for some of these centrifugal forces uh, which tend to fragment uh, the European Union. And while Russia's annexation of, uh, of Crimea um, and its role in the Mediterranean have in fact uh, provided a unifying theme, uh, the, uh, the refugee crisis has created new dividing lines uh, with regard to the redistribution of asylum seekers, um, to the management of external borders, etc. And taken together, these economic, financial, and refugee crises uh, have fanned the flames of intolerance uh, in Europe, uh, both at the societal level as well as at the political level, thereby leading to an erosion of solidarity between uh, the member states. Now, parts of the European Union have, uh, have proved dysfunctional, uh, but are being repaired and, uh, and or replaced. And as always, of course, finding compromise between 28 member states is a difficult and lengthy uh, process, 
but the core belief remains that it is in the great majority of member states strategic, uh, political and economic interest to tackle the current but also the future uh, challenges and to seize transnational opportunities through the year and by way of the European Union. So the European Union to most of the member states is still a force multiplier uh, to, to punch above uh, their, their individual weights. And I'm not convinced uh, that a possible Brexit, a British exit from the European Union, you know that the referendum there uh, is scheduled for the 23rd of June. I'm not sure whether a possible Brexit uh, will change that fundamental calculus. So the EU will remain, uh, but its shape will continue uh, to change. Now having said that, uh, and made the case that, the, that there is a reason why I'm on this panel basically, I'd like to turn to the, to the NISA uh, region. What, what are the key words for uh, the EU's involvement in the, in the future? They remain, I think, stability and uh, prosperity. Uh, to create uh, a ring of friends around the European Union and turn, that, you know, turn away from the ring of fire uh, which currently uh, surrounds the, uh, the European <coughs> Union. Now, this will encompass at least five policy actions, I think, in the, in the future. And the first would be um, a common action against terrorist groups like ISIS and its affiliates in Europe first, homeland security uh, first. The second would be the involvement of the EU and the uh, big three uh, member states plus Italy in the Geneva process for, uh, for Syria. The third would be the involvement of the EU, and by way of the High Representative uh, for Foreign and Security Policy, Federica Mogherini, in overseeing the proper implementation of the, of the nuclear deal with uh, Iran. And fourth, um, policy action initiated now by France to relaunch the peace process between Israel and Palestine. But the number one, and the fifth uh, in my list, the number one preoccupation for the European Union is and will continue to be migration from uh, the Niza region. So expect the European Union to push uh, for uh, the negotiation of border management and readmission agreements with other states than Turkey. The, the deal with Turkey which we struck uh, two weeks ago uh, is, is considered crucial in certain corners of the European Union in stemming the flow uh, of refugees and migrants crossing the Aegean uh, Sea. But the open and, to my mind, shameful uh, divisions between the EU member states over controlling this uh, human flow, returning people and accommodating uh, the Syrian refugees who are admitted, show um, that much more is at stake than this one deal alone. Indeed, even if, and it's a big if, even if uh, this agreement uh, with Turkey is implemented effectively, then uh, the, the deal is hardly a solution to Europe's growing migration problem from the Niza region. Since the deal was put in place uh, two weeks ago, the numbers of entries to Greece have dropped, have not stopped, um, but numbers have risen uh, from, uh, from Libya. And, uh, and accommodated in, in Italy, usually picked up by either the Frontex or the uh, naval force which the European Union has um, off the coast of, uh, of Libya. So this shows that Syria and by extension of course Iraq uh, are only one element in the migration equation on Europe's southern periphery. Chaos in, in Libya, um, looming uh, instability in Algeria, could well produce new flows uh, of uh, refugees and economic migrants and the potential for economic, who knows, maybe even security uh, meltdown in, in Egypt could produce uh, a migration flow on an even larger scale. Some even say um, that Turkey's were, uh, worsening human rights uh, record and war in the southeast of its, uh, of its country might propel a wave of political asylum seekers towards the European <coughs> Union, thereby defeating the deal which the German Chancellor uh, has fought so hard uh, to achieve. Now beyond uh, crisis management, 
uh, Europe will continue to be affected by the migration uh, driven by the immense uh, prosperity and stability gap between North and South across the Mediterranean. Conditions in Sub-Saharan Africa, in the Sahel, uh, and the Maghreb will be as critical as those in the Levant in, showing, in shaping the flow of migrants uh, to Europe. So therefore I expect the EU, uh, through its development programs, through its uh, security uh, missions and intertwined uh, with, uh, with anti-terrorist um, activities, to, to push also for talks with countries in the Levant um, to, um, to, to forge deeper and co more comprehensive uh, socio-economic and trade uh, relationships like the kind we've seen um, in the East and are now being negotiated with, uh, with Tunisia and, uh, and Morocco in the hope of tackling some of the root causes of migration. So by way of conclusion, uh, Gaudan, I'd say that uh, the Union will need to address uh, the prospect of a sustained disorder in the South, to its South and its Southeast, uh, as well as geopolitical challenges emanating from the East, uh, with uh, what it sees as, as an unpredictable uh, uh, Russian uh, partner, not simply as a question of crisis management, but also as a longer term uh, condition. And this will have, it will have to be done and it will probably continue to be done so in a holistic fashion, marrying security approaches with, with softer um, uh, human security approaches. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I want to, uh, to take this opportunity to thank uh, the uh, organizers, SSN and Orson, for hosting and inviting me. Um, I want to change uh, the pace a little bit. By my background, I work for a think tank in Shanghai Jiaohong University in the city of Shanghai, uh, the uh, China equivalent of Istanbul, actually. Uh, and uh, the think tank is partially funded by the government money, uh, the university fund, and partially funded by private money. So at least part, half of my, what I'm going to say is true. <laughs> But <laughs> that, that's your, your guess. You have to guess it. Okay. Uh, uh, what what uh, I want to do here is uh, actually to give you a, a frame of, framework of thinking about China and the Middle East uh, in terms of uh, methodology and also ask a few questions uh, that what uh, I think uh, many of the experts here, including several of my Chinese colleagues, can fill you the details. Uh, by way of asking questions, uh, I'm uh, sort of uh, uh, trying to lead you to see, to, to, to say that, that uh, to think that these questions are more important than the others. So the framework is uh, about China's political system. China is a one-party rule. It's more or less like our hosting country here, and uh, or more extreme. And the one-party rule is uh, also uh, uh, characterized as a one-person leadership of a party, even though there are other entities and institutions under him. It's mostly based on this one president, Xi Jinping. And uh, so his personal background and uh, mentality is very important for China's foreign policy making. And uh, he's the second generation of revolutionaries based on the Chinese culture of filial piety. He's, he has these following priorities and to borrow a term that pretty frequently heard in the U.S. political scene, the legacy. So we're asking what kind of legacy President Xi Jinping wants to have at the year 2020 or even beyond it when he has to uh, get off from his position. So I think the number one is he doesn't want to be the Gorbachev of China. That's the number one priority. I'm listing the priorities in the, in the order of importance according to him. Uh, this is well literature, you can find uh, why I'm saying that everywhere, open sources. So basically he doesn't want the Chinese Communist Party's ruling in China ends in his hands. Number one priority. For that priority, he, there follows, he doesn't want any territory losses happen under his rule. And following that, he doesn't want social instability within China 
and stagnation of economic development. The last two are actually linked together. Thinking of it, the last two and the uh, previous one, which is the uh, no loss of territory of China to foreign powers, are also linked because his father's generation gained the legitimacy of ruling China based on the eight year of anti-Japanese war. So put all these into his mentality framework, what happened, whatever you read about China uh, in news, you can understand why the very high tension a few years ago between China and the Japanese on the Senkaku Island issues and today in South China Sea, all the tension there. So it's South South Asia. And uh, to put everything into the uh, Middle East region, including South Asia, uh, and uh, the often quoted term of One Belt, One Road term, uh, initiative, you can see for him the number one priority is not to build up the infrastructure of the Middle East to help the people here, but to help the people within China to have a better economic status, thus lead to better social stability, and also the, his high profile uh, uh, propaganda or high profile publicity uh, relating to the South China Sea issue, to the western region of China in terms of territory independent movement in Tibet, in Xinjiang, and also the territory uh, dispute with uh, Japan, all these uh, are well fit into uh, the one belt one road system because this system uh, economically is designed to export the excessive productivity, productivity related to infrastructure building within China. Uh, that's, a, that's a pretty obvious economic uh, uh, driver for this whole initiative and uh, uh, the AI Aviation Infrastructure Investment Bank was established based on that at the uh, sort of intermediate peak of the Chinese stock market and now uh, as I have learned yesterday last night there's not even a penny being invested under the name of AIIB not one project being managed under that umbrella so it's still ongoing but for the other leaders within China all these priorities are actually the same but in different orders for example, uh, for the Premier, Prime Minister, who is not the second generation of the uh, revolutionaries, he has the same priority, but probably the economic development and social stability is on the number one uh, position, in the number one position, instead of keeping the uh, uh, territory, maybe territory dispute can be put aside, uh, uh, not the number one priority, unless foreign powers really step into the Chinese territory, uh, territorial issue and trying to grab land or see power, or see uh, sovereignties from China. Other than that, there's no need uh, for this tier of leadership to in and stir up uh, international dispute with the South Asian neighbors, and Southeast Asian neighbors. So it's a different priority. So looking at these priorities, uh, the Chinese relationship under the One Belt, One Road initiative umbrella uh, with all the Middle Eastern countries can be divided uh, to three aspects. Number one is economic relationship, which is uh, uh, including traditional energy cooperation, trade partnership, and also uh, infrastructure building in these countries, typically in the form of BOT. Uh, build, operate, and transfer, and also uh, technology innovation, green technology uh, cooperation. So, if you put your country, if any of the Middle East country put yourself into this framework, you can see uh, what's there. Uh, this country, you, your country, or any country can offer to the Chinese leadership in terms of these four, three, four aspects. And uh, uh, fortunately or unfortunately. Uh, I don't want to comment on that, but uh, uh, after uh, about a half a decade of evaluation, uh, uh, the state of Israel comes to the top because China wants to work with the country, not only can get involved in investment in their infrastructure, in the building of in 
infrastructure, but also in partnership with the technology innovation so that can help China to uh, migrate from a uh, manufacturer-based industrial power to a knowledge-based, service-based, and innovation-driven economy. That's one of the uh, number one priority China is trying to achieve uh, in the uh, economic development effort. It's a so-called new norm of slower uh, economic uh, development speed, but uh, more of an innovation-driven, knowledge-based. And uh, from that perspective, uh, you can think about all the other countries, the Gulf region. The Gulf region is a little bit different because they have all this sovereign fund, which is actually an integral part of the international merger acquisition and, and, and investment scene. So it's part and part. But with Iran, with uh, North Africa countries, with Egypt, with all the initiatives, uh, none of the country has a comprehensive portfolio uh, of cooperation with China than the country of Israel, and probably the following one would be Turkey and Iran, and Gulf countries and all the other countries. Okay. So this is the, the framework and the question. And uh, in, in way of conclusion, I have two questions to ask. One is uh, uh, to jump out of the one belt, one road uh, slogan. Uh, you have to think what China is doing uh, in the Middle East right now that China will still be doing even without this one belt, one road initiative. My personal answer is China is doing whatever it can do even without the term. The second question I have is uh, uh, what's the biggest international power that can challenge President Xi Jinping's number one priority? I would, uh, probably everyone in this room can put the name out, it's the US, the, the leadership of the Communist Party for the next, I don't know, five decades. U.S. is the only power. But uh, China is doing many things I think the U.S. is not willing to do anyway in these countries along the One Belt, One Road system. So China is doing the dirty work, doing the infrastructure investment and building, but China is weak, very weak in terms of country building, nation building, uh, civil society building, and all these expertise, which is uh, just the strengths of the European countries, with their experience after the war, Second World War, uh, the strengths of the U.S. And I think for the U.S. and other powers in the world, international powers, to work with the Chinese so that uh, not to irritate the number one priority of the current one party's one person leadership, is to do the things that uh, uh, these powers are already good at and uh, leave whatever China is doing there, and China is good at building a brand new city from scratch or from an old small core, but after this building being set up there, after the new train station, even after the ZTE or Huawei's internet infrastructure being put into these cities, you need population to fill that, and you need the population to be uh, well, uh, well uh, their economic income is stable and so that they can live there happily ever after. And this is something that China is actually seeking friendship and seeking partners to do. Thank you. Uh, morning. My name is uh, Rick Russell. I'm a professor at the NISA Center. Uh, my uh, agenda for this morning is to talk about the United States' position in the world, particularly vis-a-vis -vis the, the major powers. I come from a political culture that's very open and free to criticize our government, so I'm going to take full advantage of that. Uh, uh, let me start, I want to, in the interest of time, I want to start with a thumbnail sketch. I want to look at some, and my argument I'll make is that in the last five years or so, the American security position in the world, particularly regarding the major powers, has deteriorated. The United States today is in a much worse security position geopolitically than we were five years ago. That's my argument. I'll talk a little bit about the Middle East, major powers in the Middle East, some of the problems that we've had there. And then I'll look to the European theater, yet another major focus of American security interests. Look at Asia, and then the big, as we say in English, the big elephant in the room. I'll just table a couple of issues regarding the American domestic politics. This looms large. I mean, when we talk about our presidential campaign, it has huge consequences as for Americans, but also for, for our security partners throughout the world. So let me put that table of these issues. Let me talk about the Middle East. Uh, we've made a lot of mistakes, in, in my view. I think, first and foremost, when you looked at the Arab Spring, 
2011, I think the Americans and many of our European colleagues were sort of captivated by this idea of democracy and democratization. And once you have democracy, you have peace. And I think that those were proven to be really naive thoughts. I think American policy handled uh, President Mubarak's ouster very poorly. I think President Mubarak was a strong, reliable security partner of the United States for 30 years. I thought the United States, you know, his position probably was not tenable, but I think the United States could have done a much, much better job diplomatically of having a dignified uh, departure from President Mubarak from the, the political scene. I think the way that the, the Americans went back and forth and treated Egypt, I think that, that gave powerful, powerful negative messages to our security partners in the Gulf. I think, quite frankly, the Gulf monarchies were absolutely horrified and angry at how poorly the United States handled President Mubarak's ouster. I think that they, you know, they, they're in the position of making an argument that, look, if you did this to Mark, what are you going to do to us? And I think that's kind of not polite to say in my company, but I think that's the reality of the perceptions. I think to add insult to injury, I think the Gulf states were horrified the way the United States is sort of vacillated with the policy vis-a-vis -vis Syria. Uh, particularly, we'll talk about this, I'm sure it will come up, with the American declaration of a red line in Syria for the use of chemical weapons. Everyone was anticipating, both in the United States and the world, that President Obama was going to, President Obama, excuse me, President Obama is going to follow through and, and have some type of punitive, retaliatory military strike. And for him to reverse course on that, I think it sent a very, very powerful message to many people who are watching, particularly the Iranians, the Chinese, and the Russians. And we can talk about that in a bit as well. Uh, so, you, for a variety of reasons, um, you know, if you had Mubarak's ouster, you had the red line in Syria. That has caused a lot of frustration among Gulf states, but probably one of the greatest sources of tension with American powers in the region is to deal with Iran. And we'll talk about this uh, throughout the, um, the, the program, but I think that they're of the view, as long with the Israelis as well, is that what you have in place is Iran is now reintegrated in the international community. Its economy is going to be reintegrated into the world economy, notwithstanding its remaining sanctions. It gets an infusion of capital, and yet it's its nuclear program from mining to enrichment uh, to production of, of fissile material remains in place. It's broad, it's deep, it's diversified, it's industrialized. So Iran today is a de facto nuclear power. Uh, so I think that's a great deal of frustration with the Gulf states as well as with Israel. So it's amazing today to see the confluence of interests, security perceptions with Israel and the Gulf states, and they're at odds with the dominant security perception of the region and of Iran that, that, that permeates the Obama administration inside Washington, D.C. So that's a very interesting set of circumstances. So that's a, essentially a snap, the major issues, frustrations in the region writ large. Let me sh shift a little bit to the European theater. Uh, the United States has been a major uh, European power. I think that we were slow to recognize that there's been, and I think our European, the European NATO members are very, very reluctant to see that war, in my view, has returned to Europe. I mean, the, the Russians had a very sophisticated hybrid warfare that essentially invaded and violated the territorial integrity of Ukraine. You now have war returning to Europe. I think the Americans are been, again, sort of vacillating in terms of its policy, but I think the European NATO members have been even more reluctant to acknowledge the, the new reality of, of uh, strategy in, in Europe. The United States is sort of belatedly recognized. We now have a longer term interest in, in getting a brigade back into Europe. But when you look at a brigade, a brigade is very small. It's minuscule. When you look at the professionalization, the downsizing that the Russian military has done in the past five years, it's very impressive. So if NATO does exercises in the Baltic states that we think are large or 4,000 troops, the Russians do on the other side of the border 70,000 troops. It's much more formidable. So if you've got the Middle East, you've got European dynamics changing entirely for, for NATO, then the other theater of operations for the United States is Asia. Now the Obama administration has made a lot of fanfare of a, of a pivot to Asia, but the pivot to Asia strategically is faulted for, for two reasons. One, it, it doesn't acknowledge the long-standing, since World War II, relationship we've had with security alliances in the region. The United States you know, has lost you know, 100,000 troops in Asian theater during World War II. We lost 50,000 troops in the Korean War in the 1950s. We lost 57,000 in Vietnam in the 1960s, 1970s. These are formidable 
formidable, uh, you know, um, tragedies that we faced in the European theater. Couple to the fact that the United States Navy traditionally has had most of its assets in the, Europe, uh, the Asian theater. On top of which, most of what's in Asia is the more modern side of what we've had in the European theater. So I think this pivot to Asia is sort of a, a failure to recognize the commitment, long-standing generational commitment the United States has had to security in Asia. But I do think it reflects, and this reflects many people's thinking in the region, is that it reflects an interest of the Obama administration to focus less on the Middle East and more to other places in the world. And Asia looks to be more, more uh, inviting, if you will, in terms of growth, economic de development, and, and, and beneficial relationships versus what we've seen in the Middle East as being you know, a, a lot of resources devoted to it and very little in terms of the American perspective to see in, in return. So that's the Asian and the European theater. So let me talk a little bit just quickly about the domestic scene. And I'll tell you, it's nothing short of chaos in terms of the American political process. What you have is two candidates battling the honor of the Democratic side. Um, uh, uh, Secretary Clinton, Hillary Clinton, is a much more known entity for all of us. Uh, you know in the presidential campaigns, every, every candidate has a staff that generally develops an informal cabinet, if you will, of people that develop the foreign policy positions that will serve the government in waiting to come in to a new administration. Secretary Clinton has a formidable Rolex. She's got a lot of people that are very substantive on her team. Uh, there are people that are very high profile. You know many of them. Uh, so she's more of a known entity in terms of foreign policy if she were to be elected. Uh, Bernie Sanders, however, is a completely unknown. Uh, the criticism in Washington of Bernie Sanders is he doesn't even have a foreign policy team. In fact, he went out publicly and named some people that he takes advice from, and the people, including a friend of mine, was, was surprised to hear his name. I mean, so he talks to people, but he doesn't have a formal structure. On the Republican side, the Republican sides are really on the cusp of a civil war. Uh, you've got traditional Republicans being absolutely aghast at what they've got for candidates in terms of uh, Donald Trump. Uh, many Republicans have said publicly they won't work for Donald Trump. Uh, Donald Trump's foreign policy is, is very difficult to ascertain. He, I, if you're interested in getting a sense of that, he's given two interviews, one to the New York Times, one to the Washington Post. Uh, he's all over the map. I mean, he's done very uh, derogatory comments regarding um, NATO, the, the need to, to abolish NATO at a time when European security demands are increasing. He's talked about uh, security to the uh, South Korea and Japan as if it's some type of racketeering. The United States, you know, they, they should be paying the United States for, for, for protection. So he's all over the map. He's very much of a unknown. And likewise, uh, uh, Senator Cruz has got some foreign policy teams, but they're, they're much more of the hard, hard right of the Republican Party. So the, law, the, the bottom line is it's a very confusing time in American uh, domestic politics. It's going to be very difficult to ascertain, with the exception of Secretary Clinton, what the foreign policy orientation is going to look like. And it's going to take a year after the election to get any American foreign policy team into place, given the, the nature of our structure. So with that, I'm not sure you know what I'll say. Things are in, in, in great flux inside the United States and our security situation vis-a-vis -vis major powers in the Middle East, in Europe, and in Asia have deteriorated over the last five years. Thank you, uh, Gardat. So uh, I will be presenting uh, on the Turkish uh, take on these guys because Turkey is not uh, dressed as a great power, but has to wrestle with uh, all of these previous speakers' uh, countries in different capacities and in different roles. So my intention in this short presentation is to uh, sort of uh, split uh, Turkey uh, between the region and the international system or levels of analysis, as uh, Galtak mentioned, because also for my uh, PhD uh, dissertation, I tried to develop a model of uh, regional power behavior using the levels of analysis uh, framework. So my intention is to see how Turkey uh, deals with the uh, different pressures uh, coming from the regional system on the one hand, and international uh, system great powers uh, on the other. So in that sense, first we have to start with a kind of a brief uh, theoretical uh, discussion, how to define 
how to conceptualize the Turkey, what kind of a power the Turkey is. We need to uh, respond to that uh, question. And there has been some uh, discussion in that respect on this uh, particular question because there are different labels uh, which have been uh, circulating around to define uh, Turkey's international role. Uh, sometimes we see people uh, using rather fancier uh, terms such as the uh, new common Turkish foreign policy, some see Turkey pursuing some imperial ambitions in the neighborhood, so on and so forth. But uh, personally, I still uh, believe that uh, the best term to define Turkey is the regional uh, power. Uh, some people tend to use uh, uh, rising powers uh, and recently the acronyms uh, sometimes they are also used to define Turkey, but the regional power is a useful uh, concept. And as uh, our uh, Prime Minister himself has also uh, argued, uh, according to some uh, theoretical insights, Turkey can also be defined as a central, a central power, and this is the term the Prime Minister, when he was an academic, uh, used to refer to. But uh, the term central power, in some respects, uh, does overlap with the regional power, but in essence, it uh, implies something larger than uh, regional uh, power. It is not an ordinary regional power in this way. It is a specific uh, and special uh, regional uh, power. But I tend to use Turkey uh, as a regional uh, power. And in that sense, the recent uh, theoretical literature on regional powers is useful to understand and uh, conceptualize uh, Turkey's relationship with the international system and the regional uh, systems. Here uh, we can look into three uh, different uh, roles that uh, regional uh, powers can play. I think this is important again to conceptualize Turkey. Firstly, the regional powers uh, can play the role of maintenance. And secondly, they can play the roles of uh, leadership. And thirdly, they can play the roles of uh, representation. So when we say maintenance, we assume that there is a regional order which is in place, which is established, structured, and the regional power in question is uh, satisfied, which means it is a status quo power. So in that sense, the regional power tries to maintain the existing regional order. But the leadership role uh, comes into play when the regional uh, order is in question, when there are discussions about the future of the regional uh, order, or, on the other hand, the uh, regional power itself is a revisionist uh, power or wants to change the existing uh, regional order. And this is where the regional uh, powers may play leadership role to shape the region in a new format. And the third uh, role is representation role. This is important, I think, to again conceptualize the current wave of regional powers, especially the so-called rising powers. Sometimes we see that the regional powers uh, do play the role of representing the region at the international level, vis-a-vis -vis the uh, great powers at the international uh, system. And when we look at Turkey's behavior, we see from time to time Turkey playing uh, different roles at different capacity, and it does create some of the uh, confusion and some of the discussions about Turkey regional and internationally. So I will not uh, delve into deeper, but it's very I can expand on them. So in my understanding, a regional power such as Turkey is uh, situated at the intersection of the regional system and the international system. And in that respect, the regional power intermediates the pressures coming from the region on the one hand and the pressures uh, coming from the international system on the other hand. So in a sense, the regional power uh, from time to time uh, plays the role of the transmission band between the region itself and the international <coughs> system. And then the key question in that respect to understand the foreign policy challenges of a regional power at a specific time is to understand where the big pressure is coming from, where are the risks and threats and opportunities uh, placed. From time to time we see that the main challenges to Turkey uh, come from the international system. In other times, we see that the main challenges and opportunities are in the regional system. For instance, when we uh, go back to 2003, American invasion of Iraq, the main challenge uh, came from not Iraq, not from the region, but uh, from the 
United States, especially policies uh, pursued by the United States administration of the time. So the international system was presenting more challenges to Turkey than the regional system. But when you look at the Turkish foreign policy today, you see that the main challenges are in the region. So the big uh, security risks, uh, which we will discuss, which was also mentioned by our uh, keynote speaker uh, last night, are in the region. Now Turkey has to manage the region. But in order to do so, Turkey has to leverage the international system, uh, leverage the great powers, so that it can uh, assist uh, this uh, process of managing the regional challenges. So I will also introduce another two concepts uh, which are important to analyze regional powers and Turkey. Uh, what kind of a disposition uh, a regional power has vis-a-vis -vis the international system? And secondly, what kind of strategies uh, the regional power uh, employs in its uh, pursuit of foreign policy interests. In terms of the disposition, uh, we tend to make a distinction between revisionist policies and status quo uh, policies. Uh, on the other hand, in terms of strategies, we can talk about unilateral or multilateral strategies. So when we look at Turkey from that uh, angle, uh, we see that in terms of its position uh, on the existing international system, which is still uh, dominated by the post-war uh, American uh, neoliberal uh, international system. So from time to time we see Turkey criticizing uh, certain aspects of the existing international system, but despite that I think Turkey's on balance is a uh, status quo power. Unlike some of the other uh, currently rising regional powers, uh, Turkey is not uh, directly challenging the existing uh, US-based neoliberal international system. So Turkey still buys into the main norms of the existing international system. But it doesn't mean that Turkey does not raise criticism vis-a-vis -vis the international system. And uh, maybe you, uh, those of you who are following Turkey and our Turkish colleagues would recall in recent years one of the mottos uh, of uh, the Turkish uh, foreign policy is expressed by our President is uh, the world is bigger than five, meaning uh, bigger than the five permanent members uh, of the United Nations Security Council. So there is a criticism directed toward uh, certain institutions and practices of the existing international system in terms of economic structure, in terms of political and security structure. But at the end of the day, Turkey is still willing to play within the existing international system, not to work toward uh, building an alternative uh, vision which may not be for some of the other rising powers. So in terms of strategies, uh, the second uh, dimension, I see that uh, Turkey is on balance uh, preferring uh, multilateral uh, strategies, more of a policy of interdependence. It doesn't mean that from time to time Turkey tends to act unilateral, uh, especially in the region. And in that sense, uh, autonomy is an important concept here especially uh, given the thinking of our uh, Prime Minister as a scholar, it places a very important role on uh, autonomy, uh, Turkey defining its own interests and policies. But despite that, at the end of the day, uh, this is my uh, also criticism toward uh, uh, some of the uh, conceptual foundations of the current uh, uh, Turkish foreign policy. Because of the limitations of our own capacity as well, we need to act multilaterally. Uh, we cannot uh, play a unilateral uh, game. We need to make a good use of interdependence. Uh, we need to use strategies of soft power, and this is uh, one of the uh, critical uh, dimensions of uh, Turkish foreign policy. But now, when we look at the current specific, uh, more specific uh, challenges, uh, regional and internationally, we see that in the uh, regional dimension, uh, Turkey is not an ordinary uh, regional power, as I also said earlier. And this is why uh, the Prime Minister Davutoglu calls Turkey as a central power. But I tend to call Turkey as a multi-regional -region, power, which means that Turkey is not a member of a single uh, regional subsystem but Turkey simultaneously is part of different uh, subsystems. So in that sense, Turkey has this unique characteristic uh, of being part of different regions at the same time. 
It means that uh, Turkey has to balance its interest in one region vis-à-vis uh, -vis its interest in the other regions. And from time to time, one region might be more important than the others. So currently, when we look at the Turkish foreign policy, the Middle Eastern and North African angle, uh, regional dimensions, the most pressing one. And here, uh, the big challenge for Turkey is the regional transformation, which has been incomplete and uh, process which started as a socio-economic political transformation reform uh, demand has been securitized and right now uh, we are going through a very uh, major uh, security risk in the region. Now the big challenge for Turkey is to play leadership roles in the uh, region, especially the uh, region, to help stabilize first and secondly rebuild a new regional order. But in order to so do so, we have to do first nation building, state building, as well as I mentioned. These are huge pressures, and then uh, I don't think that Turkey can handle uh, that uh, challenge and burden on its own. Turkey has to leverage international support. But in that process, unfortunately, uh, uh, since the start of the so called Arab Spring and later, however you call it, there is a debate. Uh, the international actors, including the EU and the United States, have failed to assist the regional transformation. I remember the discussions we had with our European colleagues back in 2011, 2012. There were always discussions about nice projections, how Turkey and the European actors can assist the transition to Tunisia and Egypt and that. But after a while, I think uh, the Western actors, Western uh, partners of Turkey, uh, realize that the transformation may not be in their uh, best interest and secondly uh, they also were not willing to uh, bear the burden for assisting the political uh, transformation as a result there was under uh, delivery and unfortunately the political transformation has uh, taken a negative turn and now we are going to a very uh, rough uh, uh, rust, uh, period secondly Turkey sees that at the international level, there are some changes, there are major discussions, uh, some people, some scholars call it as a power transition, uh, according to some. Some call it moving into post-American world, some call it rise of the rest, some call it rise of Asia, some specify only the rise of uh, China. But something is happening at the international level, so the international structure is also going through some change. Now in this juncture, uh, so Turkey has to make a very careful reading of both the international and uh, regional environment, so make the uh, right adjustments uh, to find the, the best balance. But uh, as it comes to our main uh, ally, great power ally, the United States, so in recent years uh, Turkey has seen that it has been difficult to uh, take uh, the constructive engagement uh, of the United States granted in the regional issues that has been uh, some uh, problems in terms of uh, leveraging. And another uh, recent development for Turkey in that respect is uh, our uh, neighbor, another great country, Russia, Russian uh, policies. In recent years, uh, they have also uh, turned uh, quite uh, destructive in the sense that rather than helping uh, stabilize the neighborhoods, Russia has been uh, contributing to destabilizing trends. Now Turkey has to also uh, live with that. So in the international environment, in a sense, in terms of potential partnership between Turkey and the great powers, Turkey does not currently see uh, an optimistic uh, picture uh, because of the transition of the United States into next uh, presidency, the policies of Russia, which are seen more uh, destabilizing, <coughs> and the uh, poor uh, performance of the European Union uh, on the international stage. So, Turkey is uh, facing difficulties in leveraging international uh, support in the regional policies. Uh, about China, uh, unfortunately, uh, the Turkish uh, Chinese uh, partnership uh, has not been uh, up to uh, what we uh, would demand. <laughs> We would uh, want to see. I know that uh, our Prime Minister is quite keen on building the foundations uh, for a strategic relationship with China. He uh, has a special uh, interest uh, in that. But uh, so far, in terms of operationalizing, uh, there has been uh, 
progress, but uh, perhaps here uh, part of the issue is about what kind of a uh, role China is uh, forcing itself in the coming uh, decades. Uh, what will be the position of uh, China in terms of the transition and transformation uh, in the international uh, system? But then uh, there could be, of course, ways for Turkey to uh, seek uh, more uh, cooperation with China in different uh, regional issues. And here I will start. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm more interested in opening the floor for questions, but I will make very brief comments. Uh, first, I, I believe uh, from the four presentations, it is clear that the relationship between global powers uh, are a combination of cooperation and competition. Uh, there is a great deal of interdependency between uh, European Union and Russia, between the United States and China, but also uh, there is competition or rivalry in many places. Uh, the means global powers uh, employ to pursue their interests uh, include soft power, culture, economic power, and military power. Uh, it seems also uh, United States and Russia are more the use military power uh, more than economic power. China and the European Union more uh, depend more on economic power. And for sure, United States is a leader in soft power. Uh, Stephen talked about crisis management instead of crisis resolution. I don't know if it is better to lower expectation so we will not be disappointed. Uh, about China, uh, Chen mentioned the uh, growing uh, relationship between China and Israel. China is interested in transforming its economy to a knowledge-based economy. Uh, is there a challenge for China? Uh, China is China. China's energy dependency is growing. China imports more oil from Iran and Gulf states. Uh, will China have problem managing its growing uh, dependency on Iran and Gulf states on one side and uh, growing cooperation with Israel? Uh, I agree with Rick about uh, civil war in the Republican Party in addition to civil war in Syria and Yemen. Uh, uh, as uh, Rick said, we, we are proud to criticize our government, also at MISA, we are proud to disagree with each other. Uh, Rick uh, strongly uh, condemned the nuclear deal, I strongly support it, and uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> he's always right, but uh, I dream of the day I will take him to lecture in Tehran. <laughs> Uh, a last point uh, I want to make, uh, Shaban mentioned uh, three roles for regional powers, uh, maintenance, leadership, and representation. Uh, to, to put it in diplomatic language, uh, European Union and United States sometimes believe that uh, there is more to be desired in Turkish policy, especially with uh, regard to refugees, the war on terrorism. Uh, so, uh, is there, I, I don't want to say spoiler role, but uh, is uh, there, besides the three uh, approaches Shaban mentioned, are there others? Uh, I, I don't want to take all the time, I just thought to put these points on the table. Uh, if uh, our speakers would like to address any of them, but first I would like to, because we are running out of time, we will make the break a little bit shorter, uh, but probably at least we can spend 10, 15 minutes in question. Anybody has a question? How about take two at a time? And then, yes, sir. <coughs> Yeah. 
if you can identify yourself and a short question, please. Yeah, uh, my name is Ibtiaz Ahmed from Regional Center for Strategic Studies, Sri Lanka. Uh, this is something that the chair actually started, so if, if anybody can respond, the whole panel. Uh, this is in relation to levels of analysis. Uh, the question is whether the current international setting can be understood from the standpoint of level of analysis. That's the issue. Now, Vadim did talk about globalization, uh, but I think something that got missed in, in, in that derivation of globalization, that this is the first time in the history of capitalism you had production which has become international. Earlier, you did not have that. Now, when production becomes international, you have a different scenario altogether. So from that standpoint, my question to the panel would be whether you can sustain uh, levels of analysis as a methodological tool currently, because globalization has, has become so complex. Uh, it has made relationship between states complex. Whether you can whether you can even think of regions the way we used to think in 20th century. So my simple uh, you know question to the panel would be whether this levels of analysis is the is the right way of looking into things, or you need something beyond the realist paradigm, something post-realist paradigm, to get the sense of where we are. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for all the panels for giving a broad picture of the security situation in the, in the world. My question is uh, to Dr. Chen Yi. Um, when, uh, President Xi Jinping announced the Silk Road Economic Bill or One Bill, One Road Initiative in 2013, first in Kazakhstan and then in Kyrgyzstan at the Summit of Shanghai Cooperation Organization. It was, the, I guess, the previous reality when the Chinese economy was growing very fast and President Xi backed this initiative by tens of billions of dollars of investment into the different countries of the region. Now the Chinese economy entering the new reality and you mentioned, for example, that the Asian Infrastructure Bank has not started any projects. So do you see changes, let's say, on how this uh, uh, concept of one belt, uh, one road will be evolving in the future? Uh, from the other hand, uh, for example, recently the presidency uh, visited uh, Czech Republic and also there were billions of dollars of investments uh, made, uh, signed uh, at those meetings. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody would like to comment on the questions of Talas or Tamar Kyrgyzstan? Two questions and then two other questions. international forums which are capable to examine globalization, uh, make some uh, studies and programming and come to common ground, starting from United Nations or maybe uh, G20 or G7, uh, smaller regional organizations which are also capable to harmonize uh, economy and uh, the uh, industrial aspect which you mentioned, industrial aspect of productive uh, aspect of uh, globalization. But actually, as we all see today, or we, we speak about it, uh, the situation is not favorable, and so many contradictions, which are obvious, which are understandable, but not resolvable. That's probably uh, the main deficit, the deficit of trust deficit of partnership. Uh, probably that's uh, exactly the task for uh, research community, for <coughs> scholars like you and uh, like all of us. Let's try to do that. Uh, if you permit, I will uh, discuss it with you later. Thank you. Thank you for your provocative question. 
let me um, let me return with a provocative answer, perhaps, uh, uh, trying to, to make the case that uh, we are seeing the end of globalization as it is defined in economic terms primarily um, as a result of a sustained um, um, low cost of raw materials, um, as is expected, um, at least by, by some strategists also for, uh, for oil. Um, now, China has been a main driver of, uh, of economic growth uh, and global competitiveness, um, but that has peaked, it seems. Its growth is, uh, is going down, um, and as a result of uh, cheaper imports of raw materials, the purchasing power of the Chinese population is actually uh, growing, and so they consume more at home rather than they export. Also, China's role as, as uh, the world's assembly platform uh, in manufacturing has gone down over time. Uh, I mean, the iPhone's um, components, more so than before, are produced on the basis of uh, local Chinese uh, products. Uh, and with, with that peak uh, having, having passed, I think uh, the main driver of, uh, of economic growth and globalization, if you want, uh, is in fact waning off. Um, and so that would actually make the case uh, for regions uh, much more uh, than before. We see a proliferation uh, of acronyms also uh, in the speeches of today. I mean, the, the Asian Investment and Infrastructure Bank, the Eurasian Economic Union, uh, strangely the BRICS were mentioned as a grouping. Um, in fact, uh, I think MICTA wasn't either. Um, uh, but uh, I think nevertheless, you know, we see these, uh, these regions and their importance growing. Uh, I want to, to give a, describe a scenario that uh, as a reaction to the comment by our chair and uh, uh, Dr. Uh, this is uh, our chair said the, uh, with the uh, Chinese cooperation with uh, the state of Israel actually harm the uh, energy relationship, energy important relationship with the Gulf region countries. Uh, actually, that's uh, that's the totally opposite, as uh, you can, everyone can read on the news. There are a lot of under the table, on the table cooperation between the Gulf uh, countries and the state of Israel. And uh, many of those countries have a sovereign fund or quasi sovereign fund, like the sheikhs, uh, having portfolio managers investing in uh, high tech innovation companies, uh, first, second, serial A, serial B uh, deals and merger acquisitions. Very active. Uh, at the same time in Tel Aviv, Haifa, Dubai, Shanghai, Silicon Valley, and Beijing. It's a, it's a chain of uh, market-driven, profit-driven interaction, which is very globalized. Uh, as, as, as active, if not more, uh, than the globalization of the ISIS uh, networks and uh, small cells. Uh, so these uh, uh, profit-driven market-driven activities is not slowing down because of the uh, terrorist activities, because of all the tensions, uh, because of the, uh, sending the armies or the troops or uh, the air bombers by Russian to Syria. It's, a, it's actually more active. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a scene that is very promising and it's not uh, stopping. Uh, it's increasing, the activity is increasing. So uh, I, I'm kind of a, more optimistic than Stephen others. Uh, we will take two more questions. Yes, Another second question, 
drone warfare, do you see it as a weakness or it's an effective warfare that the Obama administration has had? The Obama administration mainly states that has been friends with anyone except the Middle East being dismantled from the terrorism or the failed regimes. Like they have been close with Cuba, with China, and having different agreements, but when it comes to the Middle East, they are just reluctant to enter and to have discussions. Well, I, I have a question for Dr. Richard uh, Russell. Uh, do you think that a multipolar world can more effectively deal with many powers like Daesh, Boko Haram, Taliban, etc.? Uh, okay. Well, thanks for the, those uh, easy questions. Uh, uh, to, to your point, the, the first question you asked about the relationship with the, um, the Middle East countries, I think you really, it, it's a case by case. You look at the relationship between the bilateral relationships in many uh, instances. And just in the interest of time, and, um, as you point out, the two uh, unique features of the Obama administration is President Obama, uh, Obama seems to be focusing on his legacy. Uh, that is to say, the legacy that the president carries after he leaves office. You know, he, he begin, you see the beginning of the, the narrative, if you will, of what his accomplishments were. And then first and foremost, he sees in his worldview the, the Iran deal as an accomplishment. I mean, so as a great, great, uh, you know, a, uh, almost like analogous to President Richard Nixon in opening relations with uh, China, or President Carter establishing full diplomatic ties with, uh, with, with China. So I think that this is how this plays in his worldview. Uh, the same with Cuba as well. This is a legacy item. Those are both um, controversial issues, but I think by and large, the American public has gone with them, notwithstanding some critics at the margin, myself included. Uh, on the drone warfare, this is an excellent point. This is a, uh, you know, there's been a profound revolution in warfare uh, over the past decade. Uh, and now what we see is the Americans have the monopoly on drone warfare, but we, we see this, this actually you know, becoming much more, you know, so you've got the Russians flying drones uh, in, in Syria, you've got the, the Chinese flying drones, you've got Hezbollah, a non-state actor uh, flying drones. So this is really a new cusp of dimension of warfare. In terms of using that, in terms of a counter-terrorism, counter-insurgency campaign, on, there's a lot of criticism saying, well, you, for example, in Pakistan, that you create a lot of collateral damage and you create more enemies than you kill uh, insurgents or, or Taliban. Um, it's a legitimate argument. I think on balance, however, the collateral damage that's inflicted by drone operations is significantly less than what you would do in ground operations. So in other words, if you did special operation forces went in on the ground, the collateral damage would be much heavier on balance than the use of uh, drone operations. Drones are very attractive for command control leadership, uh, uh, but, uh, but I mean that is insufficient in of itself for an effective counter-terrorism or, or counter-insurgency campaign. And my concern on the American side is that we become enamored with drone warfare and we forget about the fundamentals of, of the intersection of politics and, and military affairs. Uh, on the, the multipolar, we get it, this gets back into international relations theory. Is it bipolar or a multipolar distribution of power? I think we are seeing more of a, a, a more of a, whether it's globalization, there's a, dis, uh, um, uh, 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 dispersion of, of power, uh, actually I think it induces more complexities. I think that a bipolar polar relationship is, is much easier to manage comparatively, all things held exactly the same, than a multi-power. I think it requires much, much more sophisticated statesmanship and statecraft to manage multi-power relations uh, at a time where there's, there's a lot of transnational issues uh, you know, uh, whether you Boko Haram or Al Qaeda or ISIS that goes permeates between states. So I think it's much more complex, much more de intellectually uh, demanding than, than what we saw, for example, during the Cold War distribution of, of, of power. Thank you, Rick. And 